my name is Michael Gillings. I'm a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and one of my teaching responsibilities is to teach a unit called Human Biology. It's a first year general unit which has at the moment about a thousand students in it. So one of the things that I teach in this unit is how to understand evolution. And evolution is actually critical for all sorts of things that we do in modern life. It's certainly going to be critical for understanding the changes that are happening to the planet over the next 50 to 100 years and how we're going to deal with them. And so I think it's actually quite important to understand how evolution works. And although the principles of evolution are very simple, because humans only live 50 to 70 years as thinking adults, uh, we have difficulty understanding 3.7 billion years. So what I'm going to show you is about half an hour of a lecture I give in first year to talk about evolutionary principles and how evolution works. So let's get on with it. So living things like humans are amazingly complex. So here we have a single human with a single nervous system. Inside that human, there are 100 million neurons. These are the cells that take information from one place in the body to another and that help us think. Those neurons are each connected to another 1,000 neurons. So that makes 100 million million neural connections. That's a very big number and that's very, very complex. Living things are really, really complex. And it's difficult to understand how such complexity can arise through apparently random processes. And this is best illustrated by the incorrect philosophical assumption made some 300 years ago called the watch and watchmaker hypothesis. This suggests that if you're walking through a field, you see a pocket watch lying on the ground, you pick it up, it's obviously complex. And so therefore it implies a designer. The next assumption that uh, Paley made, who was the first person to say this argument, was that, well, humans are pretty complex, therefore they must have a designer as well. But of course, pocket watches don't reproduce and pocket watches don't evolve. Um, now, there's actually a logical fallacy to this argument and I'm just going to go through it fairly quickly. If a complex thing like this suggests a designer, well, you have to ask yourself about the designer. So here is the designer of that pocket watch. He's obviously more complex than the pocket watch itself. Therefore, you expect this designer to have a designer as well. That designer must be even more complex than the watchmaker and therefore must also have a designer. And that argument just continues on to infinity. So it's a logically absurd argument. So we're still left with the problem, where does all this complexity come from? We can accept that some complex things don't have to be designed. Here are some snowflakes, for instance. They're obviously complex. They're detailed, intricate, beautiful. These are not designed. These form spontaneously as snowflakes form. You know, it gets cold. On the other hand, if we have things that look pretty similar, uh, these are diatoms, same kind of stellar shape, same kind of size. Um, we have a lot more difficulty with those kinds of living things. How did these get so complex? And the reason is just pretty simple, is that we can actually watch snowflakes form. We can watch them form over three hours. We can see the evidence in front of our eyes. Um, but we can't watch three billion years of diatom evolution. And so it becomes much more difficult to see how those, those processes happen. Okay. So I thought to myself while I was teaching this unit, uh, you know, evolution is a way to make complex things, but it happens over such long time spans and it happens so slowly that it's really difficult to understand. What if I could find an example where change happens really quickly? Where you can actually see evolution in action and where you know that there are no designers in play. And one of those examples, and the one that I'm going to talk to you about today, is the evolution of language. And you can use changes in languages over time that anyone can observe and anyone can see to show that uh, 
various principles of evolution occur, like natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, punctuated equilibria, lateral gene transfer. I'll explain what each of those are in a minute. All right, so here we go. This is how evolution works. Mutations to existing genes um, lead to changes in living things. And if those changes happen to confer an advantage in the current environment, those individuals reproduce more and pass on those DNA changes to the next generation and to the next generation and to the next generation. So that's called natural selection, mutation and natural selection. So let's see how that operates in language. What I'm going to do, I've got a section here from the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, written by Chaucer in the 1400s. I'm going to pretend I can speak Old English here. So this is English 600 years ago. Of study took he musta cure and musta hida, knocked a words back he more than was nida, and that was said in forma and reverence and short and quick and full of he sentenza, so inja in moral virtue was his speecher, and gladly would he learner and gladly teacher. That was English 600 years ago. Now, maybe you can understand some of the words there. Maybe you can understand the sense of what I'm saying. I don't know. Uh, maybe my accent isn't all that good. This is a translation. Of study took he utmost care and need, not one word, etc. I'm not going to read it all out to you. But clearly, over the last 600 years, English has changed dramatically, enormously. No one was in charge of those changes. No one stood behind the language and said, oh, I think I'm going to change the pronunciation of that word to this now. And I'm going to change the spelling of that word to this. Rather, what happened is that people began to spell a word a certain way, and the more people spelt it that way, the more often it was spelt that way, and eventually the old way of spelling it disappeared, became extinct. That is mutation and natural selection happening in the language. Let me illustrate with some examples. So, interestingly, there are some words that don't change. And they're really little words, and they're words that are very common in language. He, and, word, was, than, that. Just imagine you take the word he, and you mutate it to any other thing. Ho, who, hi. It doesn't mean he anymore. So if you try and make that mutation, it's actually lethal. So some words, like some genes, don't actually change. You don't see humans, for instance, suddenly appearing with six arms. It doesn't work that way. On the other hand, you can see humans appearing with lighter skin, or darker skin, or different coloured eyes or different coloured hair or curly hair versus straight hair. And they are the equivalent of these words over on the side here. Studi, muster, said, mora, nocht. And they become study, most, said, more, not. So as more and more people pronounce those words that way and spell them that way, they become fixed. In other words, mutation, changes to pronunciation and spellings, get fixed through popular usage. And in fact, there's also some um, extinction. So some words that are in that first paragraph have disappeared. So this word, sewinja, which is translated in the modern translation as pregnant with. Actually, it means sown with. Sewinja means to sow, to broadcast seed, to be fertile and to be uh, full of promise and development. But that word has now disappeared, and it disappeared just like the dodo did at roughly the same time. So, English has changed, no one's been in charge of directing those changes, in other words, there's no designer. Rather, those changes occur by mutation to spellings and pronunciations, adoption of, by popular usage, or in other words, by replication. The more things reproduce in their new form, the more they give progeny that reproduces and eventually those new spellings and pronunciations become the way that we spell and pronounce things. That's the basis of the evolutionary process. Mutation, selection, replication. OK, so how do they get more complex? Well, here's one way. So you all know Frankenstein's monster. And that prefix in German originally, Franken, has now come in our heads to mean the horrific, artificial uh, abuse of science, if you like. It means horribly um, synthetic and terrorising. So if you take that word Franken and you put it in front of any other word, it immediately implies that. So these are words that have appeared. 
recently, frankenfood, frankenfish, frankenscience, frankenfruit, frankenfries, all of these, you know exactly what they mean without having to ever heard them before. You know that if you hear franken in front of something, it's probably synthetic and not real good for you and horrific. So you can put it in front of any particular word you want. Um, and interestingly, this is the way genes work as well. So our immune system, for instance, is able to recognise all of the different diseases, viruses, bacteria that we're ever likely to see. The way it works is by taking a bunch of genes here, three of those, six of those, ten of those, and you choose one out of there and you attach it. That's just chemistry, don't worry, we're not dying. Um, you attach one of those to one of these to one of those and you get lots and lots of different combinations. So, for instance, when I'm talking, oh, I've taken it out. I had a, I had a slide of Franken teacher in here because when I'm talk, talking to schools, I put Franken teacher in there, um, and they understand exactly what I mean. Okay. Okay. So, here's another way that English gets more complex. English gets more complex, and English is the most adaptable and uh, expressive and useful language in the world, at least I think, because it steals words from everywhere else. About 50% of the words in English are actually taken from other languages, from French and German and Dutch and Italian and Persian. So, for instance, from Persian, um, caravan, sherbet, divan. From Italian, piano, umbrella, volcano. From Dutch, wagon, measles. Um, you know, you, you, from French, cartoon, dentist. Right? All of these words, which we think of as being English words, are actually just stolen straight from other languages. Um, and in fact, that's how bacteria work as well. So you should know that, that uh, bacterial diseases, we had them under control by using antibiotics to kill them. Now, 70% of bacteria that cause infection are resistant to not just one antibiotic, but to multiple antibiotics. How do they do that? Well, somewhere in the bacterial world, there's a bacterium that produces that antibiotic. It's already resistant to the antibiotic that it produces. It's got a gene that does that. All bacteria need to do is to find that bacterium and steal its gene, and they become antibiotic resistant. Here's an example. This picture, it's happening right here. See that tube running between those two cells? That tube is the bacterium on the left stealing genes from the bacteria on the right. And so evolution works in this way as well. Antibiotic resistance spreads through what's called lateral gene transfer transfer of genes between one organism and another. English has become adaptable and resistant, if you like, by stealing words from all other languages on the planet. Okay, so there's a thing in evolution where you can look through the fossil record, right? So what you do is you look through a deposit of rocks and you look at fossils and you see that they're all the same, and they stay the same, and they stay the same, and they stay the same, and then suddenly, there's a difference. That's called punctuated equilibrium. Equilibrium just means things are the same, and it's punctuated by change to something else. Those changes are actually caused by changes in the environment. So, you know, things remain the same for a very, very long time. The organisms stay the same because the environment is the same. Suddenly the environment changes. Either new organisms come in and displace the old ones, or you get a rapid burst of evolution and the organisms now fit their new environment better. Okay, now, that happens in English too. You may not have noticed it, but it has, and it's happened in the last 15 years. And the reason is that We've had kind of a stable English environment where dictionaries and mass media and, you know, proper ways of spelling and expressing things have all been enforced through education, through, um, through things like TV, uh, popular uh, books and culture and stuff like that. But in the last 15 years, there's been a rapid change in how we communicate. Part of that has been brought about by the instant messaging by email, texting, all of the things that we now communicate with, Twitter, things like that. That's changed the way that we communicate and there's been a, been a premium put on very short words that communicate a lot of information in a small amount of text. And so this sentence here 
in the box would have been unintelligible to anyone 15 years ago. But now, we all know what this means. Hi mate, are you okay? Sorry I forgot to call you last night. Why don't we see a film tomorrow? All, right? all of you know what that means. But I guarantee that 20 years ago, if some of you were alive 20 years ago, that would have just been a string of meaningless letters. So, what we've got here is a really good example of the English language mimicking a process in biological evolution called punctuated equilibrium. Okay? So similar bursts of evolution after long periods of stability are also seen in the fossil record and that's punctuated, punctuated equilibrium. Okay, so languages clearly become more complex over time. Just think back to the first humans to ever speak, possibly um, 800,000, maybe a million years ago. We know that because we have fossils of Homo habilis that uh, there's a region in the brain called Broca's area and you can see that that gets bigger. It controls speech. And so inside the fossils you can see this region suddenly gets bigger inside the skull and that's probably where speech ar arose and language arose. Of course the first languages must have just been words for nouns. You know, fire, water, food, cave, tool, whatever. No verbs, no future, no past, no uh, you know, um, adjectives, and gradually those languages have become more and more complex and vocabularies get last longer and subtleties of communication get more sophisticated, but there's no designer. There's no one designing this process, it just happens by popular usage. The more people use a word, the more people use it, and the more meanings it tends to accumulate, and you put different words together and they mean new things. All right. So living things have also become more complex. But the difference is, and the reason why it's so difficult to understand, is because that's happened over 3.7 billion years. It's hard for us to even begin to understand how long a period that is. But I can tell you, I can give you a quick example. Imagine an Olympic-sized swimming pool and now fill it with sand. There's 100 million sand grains in that swimming pool, so you need 37 Olympic-sized swimming pools, each full of sand, and then you count every grain of sand in every one of those 37 swimming pools, and that gives you 33.7 billion. All right. So, I like to um, illustrate these... Um, hmm. Ah, here we go. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I like to try and illustrate this process in class with the students, and so we do uh, an experiment. Um, uh, kids call this Chinese whispers, all right? So what you do is you make a sentence, you whisper it into someone's ear, they whisper it into the next person's ear, they whisper it into the next person's ear. Um, and this is the experimental design here. So there's 25 students, I break them up into groups. I start off with the first person, I write the thing down, give it to them, and they whisper it. And then the last person writes down what they hear at the end. Okay, now, when I first started this, uh, I wanted to use a sentence from Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. It's really difficult to find a short sentence in Charles Darwin. He writes a very, very long sentence. This is one of the shortest ones in the entire book. I have hitherto sometimes spoken as if variations were due to chance. So I kind of like that because it's self-referential as well, because it's about generating variation. And so I give that. The other thing about this is that it's... Um, linguistically very interesting as well because languages are made up of sounds which are called phonemes and if you look at the phonemes in this sentence it's, there's roughly 35 of the 42 phonemes in the English language so it's a pretty good representation of the sounds that are in English as well. Um, so it's a nice starting uh, sentence even though, even though most of the students don't know what hitherto means. Okay, so if we do this what comes out the other end? Well here are some of the sentences that come out the other end. Um, uh, I, I, the, one I, the one I really like is The Man is Very Asian, um, which happened to be written by a, a Southeast Asian friend of mine, because he was the last person in the, in the line. Um, uh, but look, see variation is variation up there, as in ver variations in characters. All right? um, so that's a, a whole series, but I've got even more. It works with 15 as well. So you just do 15 cycle experiments, it works just as well. I have a hippo that sometimes hits my bum. Um, 
you know, I, it's just amazing. Radiation and bat attacks. How does that happen? All right? But this is a really interesting observation. And it tells us something about evolution. It shows us that evolution is actually random. Because none of these sentences are anything like each other, yet they all started with the same seed sentence. So what this tells us is if we were winding back evolution 3.7 billion years and we started it again, there's no way in the world I'd be standing out here talking to you. All of evolutionary history would be different because evolution is essentially random. It generates complexity, like humans and like the human, br human brain, but it doesn't, it's not predictable. And this shows that. Now, the other thing about this particular experiment is this, that phonemes behave like genes. So if we look at genes and parts of genes, we find that some of them don't change at all, because if you change them, it's lethal. But others, you can muck around with. So have a look. This is, so I have hitherto sometimes spoken as if variations were due to chance. Underneath are the phonemes. And if you look at the sentences that I just showed you, you can see that the I, H sound at the very beginning of that sentence often survives. Have a look at this. Look how many times the word I has survived. Look how many times the, word, the, the sound H has survived in there as well. Right? So some of these things replicate really well Others, not so well. So, um, for instance, you know, this spoken in here disappears quite quickly, but the sum of something hangs around, uh, or sometimes. Uh, then we've also got some, like, for instance, variation, the sh sound. So you see variation, variation, very Asian. But also we've got ocean there, right? So ocean, the sh sound of variation has so, um, has um, survived. And here at the very end is a good example of one of those rearrangements, you know, the Frankenstein rearrangements that I talked to you about before. You see we've got the word tune there. Well that is the ju sound of ju to chance, to chance, and then um, the ch sound of chance. Okay, so uh, actually the, the lines have slightly mixed up here. Um, in the translation between my computer and this one. But tune is an example of, of two bits of different words refusing into a new word. Um, and you can also see some inversions and movements. So due to, in this case, has come down in the third line to a different place in the sentence. That's like rearrangements of chromosomes or rearrangements of genes. And you see exactly the same thing in real evolution. So this is some amino acid sequence from a, from a protein. And you can see that, um, you know, the letters just stand for different bits of proteins. You can see that some, some of those bits are conserved across all life, from bacteria to blue whales to carrots to foxes to anything you want to talk about. Other parts are just conserved amongst complex organisms that have nuclei, this bit. Some parts are just conserved amongst vertebrates, fish, chicken, rabbits, for instance. And so we have, um, we have the same sort of processes going on in substitutions of amino acids in proteins, which in turn are caused by mutations in DNA. This kind of data that I'm showing you here has been made for every single gene that have, has ever been investigated. All of those genes are in a central repository called GenBank. It is now the largest database ever assembled by huma humans. Um, and to give you an idea of how large and how dynamic this database is, you know when you go on a web page and it's got a counter down the bottom that ticks over, and you look at it and you go, oh, 3,000 hits, that's pretty good since I set up my web page, that's awesome. Uh, the NCBI website, which hosts GenBank, gets 50 million hits a day. So. That's how many times people visit or download or get information. Every single one of the uncountable billions of billions of DNA sequences that are now lodged in that database tells us that evolution happens this way. So, evolution, the vast complexity of living things, proceeds by these three simple steps, which I hope I've illustrated happen in the um, changes 
of language as well. Generation of variation. In the case of DNA, it's the sequence of nucleotides in DNA. In the case of words, it's the sequence or sound of phonemes in words that generates the variation. Passing those variants on to the next generation. So in language, it's talking that way, speaking that way, spelling that way, using a word in a certain way. In living things, it's actually passing your DNA on to your offspring through sperm and eggs, through fertilizing and making, making new individuals. And then the survival of those variants, whether or not those variants survive, depends on how fit they are in the environment that they are in. So in organisms, Changes can occur to the way organisms behave and look and the properties that they have that make them fitter for the environment that they currently exist in and they are in turn are going to reproduce better than their, their other you know, siblings or their other members of the, of the herd or whatever. For words, it's the same thing. Words come in and out of fashion and disappear or reappear. Uh, I'll give you one example that I really hate, um, but I can't stand in the way of language evolution. Um, so there's a word that is chill, which means relax. Relax means the same thing as chill, so people have put the two things together and made chillax, which as far as I'm concerned is kind of redundant and it's an ugly word as well. I'm hoping that it's going to go extinct, um, but it doesn't seem to be. It seems to be replicating quite quickly. Um, maybe it'll just be a passing fad and in another 10 years I'll be going, yeah, remember chillax, it's now extinct, yes. Um, but when you think about evolution, try and think about the evolution of other things as well because the general principles of evolution apply to language, to jokes, to computer viruses, to ideas and to living things. Thank you very much.